can't put it off any longer. We've been trying and trying and trying to completely derail this meta Monday. But now is the time. Starting off, we have coming in last place out of about 26 factions, uh, Space Marines. Now, truthfully, there isn't a huge amount to report on Space Marines uh, because this is um, the third or fourth week in a row where they have been stone cold last, like obviously the last faction. Now, uh, and that is evident by the fact that Space Marines not only have a 38% win rate this week, but they have, on average, over the last 10 or 11 weeks, got a 39% win rate. So this isn't an anomalous result. This is bang in line with what we have come to expect from the faction since the update. Uh, so out of those, uh, there were 37 people that continue to try and persevere with the faction. But out of those 37 people, only one person, so a, t so a, a negligible amount, very well played to this guy, but only one person was able to go 4-1. Now, if we uh, go down here, we can see that some of these win rates may look better than others. So 60% for first complete task force. But actually, it's not a big deal because there were only two people that played them. So that's a, that's too small a sample size. That's, that's just an anomalous result, essentially. Uh, if we look at detachments that have got some thing behind them, we can see that uh, Firestorm Assault, eight players, uh, managed to get a 43% win rate against an average of 41%. That shows some potential. Uh, likewise, Vanguard Spearhead having a 43% win rate against 40% average with five players. That's not bad. But the, the big the big issue here is that pretty much everyone who's running Space Marines is trying to run them with Gladius because the, the word on the street is that Gladius is the best Space Marine attachment now since the last update. You then have a bunch of ra a bunch of random. So we've got Stormland Sky back here. We've got uh, Anvil Siege Force uh, not doing so good. But the good news is that these win rates might be low, but there's so few people running the detachment that its impact on the overall win rate is actually relatively uh, negligible. The, the big thing here is, you know, basically these two are trying to bring the win rate above 40%, and this is doing a good job of really bringing it down. Now. That's just that's just using Space Marines as an example of how all of these sort of stats work. If it's your first time here, what is the let's let's dive a little bit into let's briefly because we've talked about this before other weeks. Let's talk briefly on why Space Marines are doing badly at the moment. The problem is that Space Marines as a faction are suffering from severe brain drain. There is very, very little reason why, if you are a competitive player who wants to win events Space Marines, that you would run them as vanilla Codex Space Marines. You are much, much better off running your attachment, uh, running your faction as one of the Codex non-compliant chapters, like Blood Angels, like Dark Angels, like, um, like Black Templars. And in fact, right now, the go-to way of running space marines is to run your space marines as dark angels in the gladius because dark angels guys is actually really really good because the, the advantage of going dark angel if you have is you is you get all of the access to the normal marine stuff like all of the units but then you get access to some additional units as well the big thing that's putting a lot of weight for dark angels at the moment is deathwing knights and so if you are a Space Marine main, all you need to do to make your army suddenly go from this 38% win rate to a much, much higher one that will sit. Well, let's go and have a look at it now. Fuck it, let's not mess around. Up to 46%. All you need to do to increase your win rate by, on average, 8%. And actually, what's that, 17%? Look at that, Gladius on 17%. On 50% in Dark Angels and only on 33%. So if you want to increase your win rate by 17%, take your normal army of Space Marines that you've been running and basically add 10 to 15 um, uh, uh, Deathwing Knights to it. And for Space Marines, any Space Marine player out there, that is eminently doable. You you can you can kit bash a bunch of your existing Terminators and say they're Deathwing Knights. Most tournaments aren't that fussy as long as you say, yep, 
I know these aren't Deathwing Knights, but I have three spots of five Terminators and all of my Terminator Deathwing Knights. Most tournaments, especially if it's a local tournament, go, yes, it's fine, it's not a problem. Or you just go and buy three boxes of Deathwing Knights. It's even even if you buy them new in box, uh, if you go to like a third party retailer like you know Element Games, who will have like 20% off on that, um, it might cost you like 100 quid, which isn't cheap, but by Warhammer standards, not exactly expensive either and if you basically go and you know you might need a few other bits and bobs here but if you basically go and spend 100 to 150 quid um on some very beautiful terminator models anyway uh and then a weekend painting them up you have suddenly taken your space Wing army and made them just better and so what is happening with space Marines is brain drain because the space Marines, this is quite a low number of players considering they are the poster boys those are space players is quite low but going up to Dark Angels, 50. 39 of which are winning Gladius. So the hot take here is, if you want to win with Space Marines, you don't want Space Marines. You take a Space Marine army, add a few models to it, spend a little bit of money and a weekend painting, and you quickly increase your win rate. So anyone who wants to win Space Marines is doing that. So the only people that are still here I'm not trying to disparage these people, but the only people that are still here are either ones that are unaware or just don't give a shit. Um, or you know, aren't, sorry to be mean, but probably aren't very good. So the competitive cutthroat space marine players, they're all dark angels right now. And here, uh, there is the fourth category. You've got the diehards, people that are like, I don't give a fuck if dark angels are good right now. I'm going to run my Imperial Fists come hell or high water. Fair enough. That that mentality I can respect. And that's something that is important to point out. Because not everyone is... Not everyone who runs Space Marines is a remedial or anything like that. Not all. Some people like... Why do people run their factions even when they're bad? Because they love them. And a huge proportion of that here right now... I'd say 50% of it is going to be... Maybe people that are still... Just getting into the game. Like new players going for the first tournament don't realize that they should be running Dark Angels, or people that are just committed, committed to the, uh, to the faction. Yeah. So, um, but that's why Space Marines aren't doing very well. Now, it's at this point that I would normally move on, but I don't think I can today. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta delve into this a little bit more. Just, just for a moment. Okay. This is the third, fourth, fifth week of Marines just being clearly terrible. Of, um, well, not of Marines being clearly terrible, of Codex Chaos Space Marines clearly not keeping up with um, with Dark Angels. And I think that it has got to the point now where this will need to be changed. Now, the big question is, how does GW tackle this? They could do what they've done with other factions and uh, try and rework the Space Marine core rules, give them something, give them a reward for being Codex compliant. Uh, or, that, and, that, and that's, that's what I think uh, is most likely to happen. They could be waiting for Space Marine Codex 2. Those that don't know, Space Marines always get two Codexes every edition. Everyone else just gets one, Space Marines get two. So they could be just being like, we're just going to sit on this because we know that at some point in 2025, Space Marine Codex 2 is going to come out and we are going to patch it until then. Now, a good example of how GW's patched things in the past is Space Marines, Space Marines the 9th edition, about a year in, about 18 months in, we're in this exact same spot. I remember being at Adepticon two years ago and uh, Space Marines being absolutely in the shitter. And uh, how GW fixed it is they introduced the Armor of Contempt rule. So Armor of Contempt, we all know, is a stratagem now. But before the stratagem, it was a rule. And it worked exactly the same way it does now, which you say P by one. But every space Marine unit just got it. For free. Inbuilt. Always turned on. Not once per game. Always turned on. And that was how GW patched uh, Armor of Contempt uh, for Space Marines. And they started rolling out to other factions because it turned out to be a very effective um, patch um, and so we may see them do a patch like that 
and they and they had that patch basically for six months then gw fast tracked their their second codex might have been a year but they fast tracked their second codex uh, and then um that second codex fixed everything uh, in a much more permanent way it was probably a little bit overpowered the second codex so either gw i think i, th I think something needs to be done but uh, it depends on how far away we are from Codex Basement 2. Now, the other thing that could happen... This is very much going to, I think, depend on the balance team. They may not see this as a problem. They may not. Because, let me tell you something about the people that are currently... It's not a negative thing, by the way. Let me tell you something about the thing, um, about some of the people that are currently in the GW balance team. Some of these people I have met uh, before they were on the balance team, and GW has hired them in to try and balance the game, which is a good thing. Learned they're taking very experienced players and they're using them. Use the tools available in your community. These players don't see anything wrong with switching factions. These players don't really see anything wrong with, well, if Death Watch, you know, this is not now, but in previous editions, if Death Watch are good, I'll just say all of my Blood Angels are Death Watch now. If Blood Angels are good, I'll just say all my Ultra into Blood Angels now. They don't, they don't see anything wrong with just essentially switching your your army faction as long as the models make sense. I don't give a shit about the color scheme or the lore or anything. So the balance team may see this and go, yes, this is not ideal, but it's not like they don't have a solution. It's not like they don't have somewhere they can go to. And so the competitive team may regret the situation that Marines are, that Codex compliant Marines are in right now, but they may not see it as a high priority because from their perspective and from their mentality, Marines have an option to go to. So, if we don't see any changes to Codex Space Marines, that'll be, in my guess, that'll be the reason. Because they'll they'll be like, there are places for Marine players to go. And as long as every Marine player out there has at least one viable build, then they will take lesser priority to those factions which have, like, no viable builds. No so that's Space Marines. Now moving on. Now I just want to say Q Tut and Pete Jobson. Don't worry, I've not forgotten you guys. I'll get to you in a moment. All right. We'll do the bottom three, then I'll get to you. Uh, moving on, we have uh, Gene Stealer Cult. Now Gene Stealer Cult is, in my opinion, one of the great tragedies of um, edition because they are a faction that received, in my opinion one of the most flavorful codexes we've seen in this edition so far. Um, all of the different attachments add a really good feel to them. Um, and uh, they were distinctive. They had distinctive play styles. And, and so there, when, when people saw the Genes of the Cult Codex, there was a definite sort of 50-50 split within the community. 50% of players saw the Genes of the Cult Codex and went, yes amazing look at all these in-depth and interesting detachments but there were the other 50 percent of people went this codex is dog shit because it, it might be flavorful it might be interesting but there's no power behind it and unfortunately um it seems like the the latter 50 percent uh were wrong well so the latter percent were right in, in their predictions for how things were going to go for Genes of the Cult. Um, because the faction is sitting there, a Codex faction, um, they are pulling in incredibly low player numbers. Considering this is a quote unquote busy weekend, um, Genes of the Cult having 16 players is, is, is pretty fucking low. You know, and we've seen them with single digits since their Codex came out some weekends. Um, the problem is. Uh, this is not the addition for flavorful codexes. This is 10th edition. 
10th edition is the addition of competitive play. That has been evident from day one with GW releasing uh, lots of balance patches, having a real finger on the pulse of the game and, uh, and them encouraging and being directly involved in tournaments and competitive can play themselves. So, Gene Circle got a great codex. It just wasn't the codex for this edition. So th that goes a long way to explaining um, what what's happening here. So 41% win rate is bad. When, when a lot of factions are trending much more towards the Goldilocks zone, being out of the Goldilocks zone now is, is not good. 41% uh, is not great. Against an average of 41% kind of means we've stagnated around here now. It's not where we want to be. But the big giveaway is the player numbers. Like I said, very, very low. For a faction that has a codex, even due to who are relatively niche, that, that, that's low. Um, now, there are some grains of hope in here. Outlander Claw, apparently, uh, four players ran it. And between them, they were able to get a 57% win rate. And uh, that's against an average of 52% win rate. So, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of, maybe a few, a few, Maybe somewhere to look there. Uh, Brew Brother Auxiliary. It's actually the first time we've seen it being run in a couple of weeks. So, uh, fortunately, a few people, a couple of people took it. Uh, they got completely filled in. They only won two out of eight games, 25% win rate. Host of Ascension. Um, likewise, three players only won five games between them. Um, and Biothantic Brew Surge. And, and just not enough players there. Not great. Uh, now, even though Outlander Claw seems to be you know, pulling in some results, uh, Xenocreed Congregation is slightly, uh, it's slightly uh, uh, better performing. I think the issue here, though, is that there isn't a clear winner. So, you know, when we say, oh, there's not many players here, and there's two, and we say, oh, there might be some promise here when there's fucking five players, in either regard, the sample size is tiny. Very tiny. Um, these could all be just, I mean, maybe outside of Brew Brothers, but these four could all be random variations. One week, next week, out on the claw, maybe on 10%, because like one dude turned up that week and just got fucking mashed. Um, so the point is, is that the reason why there being so few players and them being so spread out is maybe a cause for concern competitively is like none of these are working. Because if one of these was clearly better, like clearly clearly better then we would see like with marines where like half the fucking people are running one detachment but they're not they're all spread out so what this says is there's very flavorful play styles everyone's trying different things out but there is not one overall dominating play style so long story short jeans look cults um they got a good codex it was a very flavorful codex but it just wasn't a powerful codex and uh, as a result, we are seeing their player numbers uh, dwindle. 16 is it's not a lot on a weekend like this. And we're seeing their win rate stagnate uh, outside the gold lock zone. Um, Gene Silicon need a fundamental rewrite. The problem with them right now is threefold. Firstly, the army rule sucks. Getting free units is unbalanced if it's too reliable because you're playing a 2,000 point game with 2,000 points. But it's shit if it's uh, too unreliable because you pay for that because they're not actually free because you're paying 8 points per guard and equivalent when I'm paying 5.5 points per guard and equivalent. So the free respawning mechanic that, that that's not working because they're, paying, they're actually paying for it but then they don't. Do you know what I'd rather have? I'd rather not my units come back for free but them cost 20% less and then I could just buy more units and bring them in how I want um, yeah it's it's back asswards the way it is right now uh, the other issue is that uh, so they're unreliable uh, the models are overpriced uh, in terms of their points in the game and then worse than that they're overpriced uh, in in real life monetary value as well uh, because they're quite expensive to, to an army but Gene Silla Cult players have shown that they would rather have cheap points for their expensive models um, and they'll be powerful. And that's the way, that's where it needs to go. So uh, yeah, Gene Silla Cult, nothing real new to say here. 
they're just still shit. And I don't think that is going to change unless they get a hard rewrite of their codex. Um, and GW basically backtracks and says, we uh, we fucked this one up, boys. Quickest way they could do that, get rid of the army rule, give everything a 20% discount, and let them and let every unit either you could specify which one goes where stop it from being too broken but give every unit either deep strike or infiltrate and um or let them pick a certain number of units that can uh, deep strike turn one but yeah that's the uh, that's the way you do it make them cheaper make them deep strike here give uh gsc players control back over their own forces because right now they've got no agency they've got no control and therefore they've got no results Black Templars. Um, honestly, this is an anomalous result. I'm not going to dwell too much on this. Uh, there's nothing new to really say about Black Templars. 41% um, win rate is just weirdly low. Uh, and you can tell it's an anomalous result because that's against an average of 49%. Um, 20 players is low, but it's actually surprisingly okay for Black Templars who have seen their player numbers stagnate around 15. So see that go going up to 20 on a busy weekend makes sense. Relatively, it's increased. Unlike GAC, who relatively haven't increased. Um, the number one thing to point out here is that Righteous Crusaders still remains the most popular detachment um, with 13 out of 20 players running it. It has an average of 48% win rate over... Um, over 10 11 weeks it's just this week it only had a 37 percent win rate but one person did go on one, one with it why has righteous crusaders suddenly gone through the fucking floor i'll tell you why because someone won a tournament with it someone won a tournament with righteous crusaders so a bunch of people pulled out their old black temple armies threw together some form of black tide army um and tried to start winning games with it uh, not realizing that um, that if for Black Tide to be effective, you have to run it in um, extremely tightly and extremely efficiently. You can't just take 120 Marines, some with fucking bolt rifles, some with fucking chainsaws, and just mash them up the board. That won't actually get there. So uh, that's what we're seeing here. A bunch of people jumping on Ratch Crusaders, trying out Black Tide and it, tanking it. The other thing that could explain it and point of note is we've actually seen consistently for a few weeks now Gladius Task Force uh, doing well for Black Templars. 51% win rate against an average of 51% win rate with six people jumping on it. Now this could mean that there is some hidden secret source with Gladius with uh, Black Templars, which is great. This may also explain this number a little bit. If we see a spike in players running Gladius Task Force and those numbers being good, it may indicate that a bunch of high skilled players who like to run Black Templars have gone over to try Gladius Task Force for a bit. As a result, their win rates aren't going into here and why it might have fallen down a little bit. So it might be a combination of high skilled players trying something else out and getting a good weekend with it and a bunch of new people coming in uh, suppressing the, uh, the win rate. Or it could be a coincidence. They absolutely could be. The, 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 what we need to keep an eye on is if the Gladius Task Force Black Temple numbers go up, if these numbers go down, and if this win rate remains high and this win rate remains uh, low. That's how we'll know the brain, the internal brain drain of the Black Templars has switched onto a new detachment. It's a little early now, but we have been seeing Gladius crop up with Black Templars for a little bit now. So they may be, they may be figuring it out. The Adeptus Custodies, yes. Not much has changed on the uh, Adeptus Custodies front. Their win rate is still uh, going in the wrong direction. They're on a 42% win rate against an average of 46. Uh, they, they have settled around 42%. It's just, just taking an, a while for the average to come down and meet that. So that's not a, another fall. Their win rate start, their average win rate started quite high, and then it's just been going down and down and down every week. Um, there's not much to say in regards to the um the distribution of players. The vast, overwhelming majority of custodies players are running uh shield host. And that's where the in fact only one custodies player 
didn't run shield host this week and he ran at, uh, auric champions and he got fucking filled in and, and went one and one and four not four and one one and four i think the most telling thing uh, about custodies well let's you know wh why is that win rate so low uh, because the codex just is very and why are so many people running shield host uh, the codex is just terribly internally balanced like they've got four detachments one of them is sisters of silence specific so it's a detachment based around about two fucking data sheets which have no real combo or anything one is based around only affecting your characters but those characters still need those characters, so one detachment only affects a minority of your data sheets in your codex. One detachment only affects a minority of data sheets in your army. And then you've got like one other detachment, which I can't remember what it does now. Um, and so the only detachment really you've got that does anything is shield hosts. But it doesn't, it's, it's a shadow of its former self, it's a shadow of the index. So they haven't really got any detachments that are any good. That's the that's the issue. The big issue I think with custodies, the most telling issue, is this number here. Now this is the lowest I've seen it in a while. I might be misremembering from last week. If I am, remind me. But that only being 25 custodies players on a busy weekend is is damning it's damning beyond repair put that into perspective there were more leagues of votan players this week than there were custodies i didn't have that much higher win rate the problem with custodies is they just feel bad to play they they don't they just don't work they're not that durable. There's a lot of damage three floating around. And um, I've spoken to a few Custodes players at the tournaments that I've been going to. None of them are running Custodes right now. They're all running their secondary army or third army. Um, I bumped into Tom the other day, uh, former uh, former comrade on the morning, of the Morning Glory channel. Uh, and he said he hasn't touched his Custodes basically since the beginning of 10th edition. So they just feel shit to play. He just plays Death Guard now. It's all he really plays. He plays Death Guard and he enjoys his Death Guard a lot more. Death Guard feel like they feel like Death Guard and Custodes don't. And so Custodes are really unfun to play. And so they're being so a lot of people aren't playing them. But them only having 25 players really does show uh, it, it's with Custodes specifically that's very bad. Because, traditionally, they are the most played faction competitively. Okay, we're not talking like they're, they're well played, they're well attended. No, traditionally, since they dropped in 8th edition or whatever it was, Custodies have been the most or one of the most played factions. And we have seen an utter collapse of their population over the last since, since the last day of Slate came out since their codex came out we've seen an utter collapse of their population and that and that shows that custodians are essentially a dead faction uh they've gone from being you know my anecdotally they've gone from being an incredibly popular faction near me to no one running them we're not we're seeing few people turn up with them each week and we're not seeing the win rate move so custodians are a faction that is hurting right now in 10th and the biggest indicator of that is not the win rate it's the population there are factions that GW needs to revisit but they will have other factions to get to first before they come back to them. chaos knights another faction which has seen a severe population decline um 43% win rate isn't great, but it's not terrible. Uh, two people able to go form one. Right. Only 12 players. Uh, that is very low. Uh, I suspect if we scroll up a little bit, we will see where all are. Yeah, there they are. 
So, we're doing a two for one now. We've skipped ahead slightly. Imperial Knights have become the, the refuge of Chaos Knights. So normally you find that sort of Imperial Knights and Chaos Knights have similar population numbers. Sometimes Chaos Knights have a few more people, uh, sometimes Imperial Knights have a few more people. But what has become, um, it, what, what's become obvious is kind of like with Space Marines, where if you're a competitive Space Marine player, you're gonna run Dark Angels. It turns out if you're a competitive Knight player, you're a little bit of a floozy. A little bit, little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a floozy, a little bit of a slag. It turns out that you don't give a shit whether you're Chaos Knights or Imperial Knights, you'll just run whichever knights happens to be more powerful at the time. And for a while, spamming Chaos Knight War Dogs was the more powerful way of doing it. Now, turns out that going down the Imperial Knight route is better. So Imperial Knights are doing great. 51% win rate, over an average of 49%, four players going 4-1. They've even won a tournament since the Banner State Slate came out, and their player numbers are skyrocketing. 36 players is a really, really, really respectable number of players. There were more Imperial Knight players than there were Guard players. It's pretty big. Um, but really what it is, is all of the competitive Knight players have now decided which faction is the right way to go, and they've gone for a Imperial Knight. Knights in general, whether they are Chaos or Imperial, are um, reassuming their mantle as gatekeepers. But there's, uh, we're seeing, th th there's nothing new to say here about knights. It's just if you're wondering why knights seem to have dropped off a lot, of, it, it's not that they have. It's just that they've all consolidated around Imperial Knights. Votan! Votan are doing, uh, Votan are in a, a weird spot. On a 45% win rate, which technically puts them in the Goldilocks zone. They also have relatively healthy player numbers for what could be argued to be a niche faction. Uh, they uh, they're relatively new, so they've not got that sort of those sort of legacy player populations behind them, like a guard and marines and chaos space marines tend to have, an eldar and whatnot. Um, so twenty eight players is good for them. Um, they're in the gold lock zone with their win rate, and their average win rate is actually forty nine percent, which puts them bang exactly where they want to be. Um, the, the problem with Votan is not, it, and they've even had a couple of people go four one, which is okay. Nothing to write home about, but it's okay. The problem I would argue with Votan is actually this number. This number is not one that we often look at. Votan have not won a tournament. In fact, I believe they are one of maybe two or three factions since the Banner State is late, which hasn't won a tournament. What that means is that Votan are a solid three and two faction. They'll go three and two, they'll go two and three every day of the week you can go to your tournament with a with the Votan army and you're gonna come wear the win under your belt probably a couple and if you have a good run you meet some some half good matchups you might even get three wins under your belt but you're not gonna go four and one and you sure as fuck ain't gonna go five and oh and win i guess this puts them a little bit in limbo because they're not bad enough to warrant any major buffs from gw but they're not good enough to warrant any attention the other way either I think Leagues of Votan are probably in a, in a fine position right now. Um, and that community is sort of building up. And there's, it, it's, it's totally okay to be in the position of 3 and 2, 2 and 3. It's better than GSC. As the Thorlek says, what Votan are in dire need is a range expansion. Votan, by the end of this year, will be two years old. They've had, as a, as a brand spanking new faction, they have had no additional units they had they've had some kill team they had a kill team box and now we know the gw roadmap we know they're not getting anything in 2024 and we know not getting anything at the start of 2025 which means at the very very earliest votan will be q2 2025 before they get anything new that's very, very unusual for GW when they drop a new faction. So, Orcs seeing a little bit of a resurgence. Their win rate is up to 46% over 42% uh, average. They've even had two players go 4-1. On and they had a 51% win rate this week with Warhorde, and Warhorde had 10 players in it, so it's not a small sample size. 
Um, where I think, uh, uh, where I think there's also some promise is in the big hunt, which had four players, which uh, got 48%, we were over 45%, and green tie, which did uh, something similar. In fact, a lot of the auto attachments seem to be settling into a 40-ish percent win rate, even if it's just like one one dude trying it. There's, there's like a lot of people seem to be able to get about 40% with all. So it can go sort of two and three. Uh, Dreadmob is still a very, very popular faction, but remains awful. <laughs> Got a lot of data now that suggests that Dreadmob ain't it ain't gonna work. <laughs> it's, it's not a thing. Not a thing. Uh, but like with Custodes, the big problem with Orcs is the player numbers. Orcs are normally a very, very, very popular faction. And at one point were the most played faction when the Codex first came, down, came out. Yeah, see, seeing Orcs on a busy week with like 27 players is bad. Uh, and it looks like Orcs and Custodes, two factions which had Codexes, have um, not felt the benefit of those Codexes. So, yeah, there's not much more to add to Orcs. Warhorde is still doing very well. Some of the other detachments seem to be able to win at least a couple of games. Dreadmob, still not the inheritors of the Orc meta that it once proclaimed to be. Orc player numbers continuing to dwindle. Sad. Apart from GW needs to uh, maybe... Un GW probably needs to walk back a few changes. Orcs are a case study in why preemptive nerfs are bad. Dark Angels. Uh, now, everything we said about Dark Angels before in relation to Space Marines, it, it pretty much covers everything. 50 players is frankly a ridiculous number of, uh, of Dark Angel players. You guys aren't all playing Dark Angels, you jammy bastards. <laughs> like, uh... That is a hell of a lot of uh, Dark Angel players. Considering that 50 dark, out of 50 dark angel players, 39 of them ran, um, 39 of them, and all, and, and someone won a tournament with them, and all of the 4 and 1 players, all of this came from one detachment, Gladius Task Force. So, Dark Angels, so hot right now. Looking at actual Dark Angels, Inner Circle Task Force, uh, Unforgiven Task Force, um, and there's one that doesn't even get mentioned anymore. They're, they're not doing great. Uh, oh, at the hunt one, whatever it is. Yeah. So this is this is just this is just a lot of competitive spacemen players right here. But there's not and there's nothing more to say about that game. Just, just wanted to cover a few of the numbers in detail. 39 out of 50 is uh, a hell of a, a skew in, into one detachment. Uh, Death Guard. So Death Guard. Um, on a 47% win rate, putting them uh, somewhat comfortably into the Goldilocks zone, over an average of 48% win rate, uh, with two players uh, managing, uh, two out of 20 managing to go um, four and one, but no tournament wins. Now the interesting thing about Death Guard is they're not a bad faction, but that's quite a low number of players for Death Guard. We have seen much higher player numbers than that in the past. We've seen Death Guard players have other players to rival, uh, much, you know, other much more popular, much more relevant, not more relevant, but more obviously powerful facts than Death Guard. It might just be a blip, but let's zoom out for a second here because there's nothing really new to say about Death Guard, but let's try and use an example of something else, some other phenomenon that might be happening in the competitive meta. It might be something worth keeping an eye on, but it seems like the player populations are starting to coalesce and solidify around certain factions. It seems like for a brief time with the balanced data slate, the population spread out and people were trying all sorts of different stuff. But three months in, or nearly three months into this um, balanced data slate, it seems like what's happening is once again, the player number, you know, with, with the new balance data slate creates a temporary flux, a temporary shifting of, uh, or, or equalization of distribution uh, of player numbers where everyone, well, you know, some people have got, you know, people have got like two or three different armies. They'll go like, I'll try my death guard for a few weeks. 
I'll try my GSC for a few weeks. I'll try my custodians for a few weeks. I'll try my knights for a few weeks. Uh, and then as they sort of play a few games, the faction, they start, It's the meta and the community starts working out where the real source lies. So Space Marine players worked out that don't play regular Space Marines, play Dark Angels with Gladius. Okay, so now all the player numbers are co coalescing around there. Chaos Knight players realize don't play Chaos Knights, play um, an Imperial Knight. And some factions like Orcs and stuff, they don't have a direct like competitor or direct an army to go to, or similar d d direct mirror faction or similar faction to go to. But a lot of people have Orcs as one army, um, and uh, they they might be just trying something else out. For, you know, they've just gone to complete different faction for the time. So um, it seems like there are multiple times we're going through this metadata where there are factions which, you know, I've got an okay win rate, um, but for some reason just don't have a high higher player numbers. And I think what we're seeing here is basically people. Um, not only meta chasing the top faction, but meta chasing the mirror faction or, or one of the sub factions that they have access to. And so, and Death Guard are a good example of that. Like, if you're so, you know, one of the things that Death Guard is doing right now is um, one of the things that, you, that Death Guard are doing right. There's two. There's two explanations where the Death Guard players. There's three explanations where the Death Guard players have gone. Firstly, it's an off week. They'll be back next week. One week. Don't don't start drawing wild conclusions from one week worth of data. That's never a good idea. It could just be a down week. Second thing is that uh, Death Guard players are um, Death Guard right now have some pretty good Terminators. But if you want to run good, if you like Terminators and you want to run good Terminators. Why wouldn't you run Dark Angels? Their Deathwing Knights just better at that. You can't run your Death Guard as Dark Angels, although you might be able to if you've got a bunch of like 30k models for them for you, you know, something like that. Or a lot of Death Guard units, you know, like Death Guard Predators are Predator at the end of the day. You bang a bunch of something else in there. You could probably make it work. But the other area where we're probably seeing a lot of Death Guard players go is just to Chaos. Good old-fashioned Chaos Space Marines. Because Chaos Space Marines are in a much, overall, much better place uh, than Death Guard. And if you're a Death Guard player, really... If you're a Death Guard player, you probably also have Chaos Space Marines. Or it's not hard for you to start getting a few units. So you, you have a bunch of... This, I've actually seen... We're speaking of 30k units. I've actually seen a bit of a phenomenon at the moment. In, uh, in in 40, in my, in my local 40k meta, and this is in two different uh, friendly local gaming stores. So this is at Just Play and at Element Games, which are about an hour away from each other. Similar area, but they do have quite distinct players. Like a lot of people who play at Just Play will, will play 90% of the time at Just Play, and only occasionally go over to Element Games. And, and same for Element Games and Just Play, okay? It's all got their own turfs and whatnot. Now, I've seen this at both venues where people will, um, they're, they're taking like, rather than 40k predators, they're taking 30k predators. Because a 30k predator, it's distinctive, but it can be used as uh, either a chaos predator a Death Guard Predator, a Zeech Predator, or it can be used as a Space Marine Predator. As long as your colour scheme isn't really tied to any of those um, specific factions or legions, you, you shouldn't have any problem taking that one model and using it to bulk out four different potential armies. And in fact, the only thing you know, if you, you the only thing you'd really need to do is just have a maybe a you know a Demon Primarch, re, you know, here and there. Maybe throw uh, a few core infantry down, um, but you know, basically, there's a, there's a lot of 30k. I mean, how did I build my Death Guard? My Death Guard are all 30k models. What do I do with them? I use them for Care Space Marines. I use them for Death Guard. I could happily use them for a bunch of other factions as well if I wanted to. No obvious chaos eruption on them. If I wanted, to, I could take all of my Death Guard, use them for 40k. 
We could use them for, for Space Marines. We could probably fucking use them for the Zinch. Much as that's going to make people cry, I probably could. Alright? So, what I would say right now is, you know, what we're probably seeing with uh, with Death Guard is, like we said, that they're, they're just... If you're a Death Guard player, it's not hard to buy a bunch of other models or have a bunch of other models in your collection, which allows you to run multiple different factions, multiple different Chaos factions. But I'd say, if you, you know, maybe Death Guard, is, maybe it's an off week, but maybe we're seeing Death Guard along with other factions coalesce around other armies and other attachments, basically do their thing but better. Um, Blood Angels, hello. Blood Angels, <laughs> eating good, man. Uh, now, the Blood Angel meta is about to uh, shift wildly because their codex is on the cusp of being released. Uh, but interestingly, that I don't think the Blood Angel meta is going to shift all that much. So as someone who's played a game of Blood Angels, as someone who's watched a few games of Blood Angels, as someone who's been talking to people with Blood Angels, there, there will be a lot of there, there could be some significant unit changes um but the the general blood angel tactics are going to remain the same it's going to be based around bricks of jump infantry and uh and how you stage them and uh, i think a reflection of the confidence that the competitive community has in the blood angel uh codex is that um we've not seen a bunch of people jump ship so, <laughs> if a codex gets um, leaked or released, and um, or, or or some people get early warning that the codex that's on the horizon isn't very good for faction, you will tend to see player numbers um, fall. They won't necessarily collapse overnight, but at the very least, they'll stop growing. A bit of stagnation. And with Blood Angels, uh, we've not seen that. In fact, we've seen the, the community uh, player numbers go from strength to strength week on week. Um, and I think part of that is people have seen the Codex now. Uh, they have seen that Death Company also be relevant, although they might need to get a few more chainsaws in their army. Uh, and they have seen that Sanguinary Guard are going to be on the up and up. Well, a lot of Blood Angel players will already have plenty of Sanguinary um, and so, and they'll see that even though maybe some of their weapon loadouts have changed, their general playstyle and tactics uh, are still going to be very, very powerful. The Codex in general looks very powerful. Um, so, I think essentially there's nothing new to say about the Dangerous apart from seeing high player numbers, to me, is a giveaway that people are quietly confident are going to remain a good faction. No one is trying to flog their army on eBay or repaint it as anything um, before the Codex comes out, which is what a lot of people do. The moment they see that uh, their army is going to be shit, they try and get it on eBay before uh, the general populace learns that the, the army is about to take a fucking nosedive. Saw it with Custodes. When the, when the first inklings came through that Custodes weren't good, um, I did this. On, I did this live on stream. I went. I went on eBay, and I was finding um, two thousand point custodies armies for you know fully painted, not painted well, but fully painted. Um, you know, fifty percent retail essentially. So um, we've not seen that Blood Angels. So uh, it looks like the Sons of Sanguinius are going to be uh, sticking around for a while looking very very potent so willie is having a 47 percent win rate against an average of 51 so that does look like maybe a little bit of a dip um i would classify that as a natural fluctuation uh 33 players for world eaters is fine it's not an increase though it's a stabilization um we may be seeing um I've heard, I've, I've spoken to a few World Eater players who have said they're getting a little bit sick of the faction only doing one thing, which I know sounds kind of silly. It's like going to KFC and complaining they only sell chicken, right? I think what, what World Eaters need is a little bit, little bit more variety. And also what you may be finding is um, if, if Blood Angels, for example, are growing, the World Eaters are stagnating or the numbers start going down, it may be because if there are two assault armies that play very similarly, but one is better people will go towards the better one. Uh, but there's nothing here to indicate that World Eaters are seeing brain drain yet. It's just something to 
keep an eye on. And in fact, this, you know, World Eaters did win a tournament. And they had, you know, World Eaters had less players, but they had more people go 5-1. and one. They had someone win a tournament. So, if anything, maybe we'll see Blood Angels go over World Eaters. We'll have to wait and see. But uh, World Eaters are doing fine. It's the same shit, though. It's Angron and a bunch of 8-bound and a bunch of cheap, shitty units sitting on objectives. Well, Angron and the 8-bounds power forward. Uh, shitty units hang back. There's going to be a Rhino with some Berserks in, around there as well. It, the, the, the World Eater internal meta is very, very well established at this point um let's have a look uh we didn't we we did not look at the dark angel tournament win or the blood angel tournament uh, not blood angel uh world eat tournament what did they win world eaters won a small ish event uh 30 players five rounds uh so that's uh, a nice local gt then Dark Angels did the same thing in uh, in Sweden. So, in Sweden, sorry. That's me. Uh, <laughs> Sweden is a um, is a quote from an audiobook that I've listened to recently. There we go. Uh, World War II audiobook. Um, so, Sweden. 35 player, five round, um, uh, five round tournament. So, World Eaters and Dark Angels still, um, uh, you know, still able to win some events, but it's looking uh, like they're mostly those sort of local events, which your instinct is going to be, oh, it's only a local event dismissed. What are the vast majority of events that people play? Where are the mass vast majority of results coming from? Local tournaments. There's a tendency in our community to dismiss RTTs and to dismiss local GTs, but actually, they, in my opinion, they are the most important result. They're the results where most people are going to encounter. People say, ah, oh, RTTs don't mean anything. RTTs are the majority of events. If you are someone who... You are much better prepping for your local RTT meta than trying to figure out the best GT Super Major meta. Because you're probably going to be playing in a local RTT rather than a, a Super Major. Uh, so World Eaters, Dark, uh, Dark Angels, they're local of the local event winners. Uh, Tau. Well, I don't know why uh, Tyranids are down here. A little bit of a blip in the data, so we'll ignore that for the time being. That might that might be... Um, I think that's meant to be Crute. That's meant to be Crute. It's the wrong name. But look at the... Uh, in fact, that's just not meant to be there, is it? <laughs> I'm not meant to be there. Look at the godlike poet. Look at the perfect spread on Tau. Yeah, look at that. 18 players retaliation card. 18 players Kayon and 18 players Monk Cat, adding up to 54 players. <laughs> oh man. 51% Monk Car. Uh 46% uh Kayon, 42% uh, retaliation card. Last week, Retaliation Card was on top. We had a couple of weeks where Kalyan is on top. Um, the the Tau meta is very well uh, balanced. The Tau Codex is a, good, is a good example of a codex where which has is a good is a good example of how a codex should be done, uh, where you've got not one detachment that clearly exceeds the others. You've got three detachments that are all very viable. Uh, we've seen. Um, there's a lot of Tau players here, 54 players, more Tau players than Guard players this week, more Tau players than Tyranid players this week, and the faction's definitely seeing a surge in player numbers. Um, what is eluding the Tau? Eluding! What is eluding the Tau is tournament wins. Now, that is not to say they don't have any tournament wins. Since the balance day is late, they have won six. But there are, there are some factors which, well, maybe, yeah, maybe I'm over exaggerating it. Everyone's really won eight. Nah, tower fine for winning tournaments. I'm just chatting shit. But it doesn't win any tournaments this week. I think Tau are establishing, establishing themselves as one of the better factions of 10th edition. Yeah, there's not much to say about Tau. They're, they're doing the same thing that they have been doing since the beginning. Just quite fast, quite shooty. Really, you just pick whichever detachment fits your personal flavor of Tau better. Like, do you like hitting the enemy hard at the beginning of the game? Mon Cat, do you prefer staging and then going for the turn three, four, five win? Carry on. Do you like 
high risk, high reward play style, go retaliation card draw. But at one time or another, in this balanced data slate, and generally since the codex has been released, all of these attachments have shown their potential. Mad as it sounds, I don't hate town anymore. Probably more codex should, codexes should be uh, given the tower treatment. I think the big thing that's gone a long way to fixing tower, and there's definitely some analogy, there's definitely some, is analogy the right word? There's some good passes that can be drawn to the guard, is uh, the, ta the, the guardification of the tower. So if we look at this, um, guard, uh, slightly higher win rate than tau. Uh, same number of tournament wins, slightly lower player numbers, but good average win rate, you know, good number of players. There's a, there's a lot of comparisons and a lot of um, similarities that can be drawn between the guard and the tau win rate. And that is because in my humble opinion, um, and whilst many tau players may strongly disagree with this or may not want to hear this, um, I think that the reason tau uh, is solid at the moment is because the ta basically GW gave Tau the guard treatment. They stopped making individual units be able to blast people off the table in one go, like entire armies. There's no more like Farsight Bomb or anything like that. There's combinations of units which can do it, just like in the guard there's combinations. But you have to build those combinations now. You can't just float around the board with your, your, your Giga Blob just slaughtering everyone. There's probably some build that can do that, and I'm talking my ass in that regard. But for most people playing the game now, whenever you come across Tau, they've got just as much shit on the table as Guard has, and they have to stack up multiple units to get the effects. They have to use force multipliers. They have to have one unit supporting another unit. They have to have, like, screening. They have, there's all sorts of things that Tau need to do, which before they didn't need to do. Before what Tau did is they would wait a couple of turns and then step out and blast people off the table. And then the addition before that, they hide everything turn one, and then turn two, they jump out and pass everyone off the table. And, to, and the addition before that, they would just walk forward and um, have an infinite uh, number of free, sh not free, they'd have an infinite number of shield drones, which you would have to strip through and then the tower blast from the table. Now it feels like tower have got a lot of stuff, in with a lot of stuff, individual data sheets are quite solid. And if you if you are if you combine a number of units together, even if it's just combining two units together, one to spot for the other one, the army gets a bit better. The army works well. So who knew that the way of fixing Tau was to make them more like that? Tyranids are doing great. This warms my heart. Seeing Nids doing good in the addition that really has been where they've been put as a, one of the poster uh, boy factions uh, is great to see. 48% win rate against an average of 47% win rate. They're right in the pocket. They're right in the Goldilocks zone. Not too hot, not too cold. Fantastic population numbers. 49 uh, players with uh, six people going 4-1. and one, And they even won a tournament this weekend as well. Let's see what tournament they won. I think it was a small one. 25 player local GT. Perfect event for a faction like Tinnitus to be able to win. The big thing, though, and something that I've been uh, saying for a while now, is uh, look at this internal balance on the Tyranid uh, uh, detachments. Now, Assimilation Swarm apparently was so shit it got mixed up with the Tau, and uh, an ending swarm has, ironically, ended. But looking at the rest of this, um, Invasion Fleet is no longer so overwhelmingly the, the obvious choice for Tyranids. Uh, you still have got 20 out of 49 players, but pre this balanced data slate, that would, out of 49 players, it would be 40 running Invasion Fleet. And that's not an exaggeration. So we're seeing Tyranid players, um, you know, still a lot of them love that, love the comfy slippers, which is Invasion Fleet. But we're seeing a few people branch out into Vanguard Onslaught, and that's actually where the tournament win came from this time. Uh, and we're seeing a few people try out Synaptic Nexus for size. The one which I think now is established, is confirmed. Half-Life 3 confirmed, okay, is Crusher Stampede. I've been keeping an eye on this attack. You know how every week I say, uh, every week I'll say, keep an eye on this one for a little bit. Keep an eye on this player number, let's see if it keeps going down. Keep an eye on this batch, let's see if it keeps going down. Keep an eye on this attachment, let's see if it keeps going up. Keep an eye on X, Y, and Z. Well, we've been keeping an eye on Crush Stampede since the balance data slate came out. 
slowly but surely that detachment has established itself as not shit anymore. I'm not saying it's the new inheritor of the Toted Meta. Definitely isn't. But when it came out in the Codex, it was poo. And a few tweaks later, a few changes here and there. And now, Crush Stampede, I never thought we'd see the day. But Crush Stampede coming up at 48% win rate against an average of 47%. It having not large, but not, not you know, insignificant number of players week in, week out. It's good. It's definitely not the go-to, but it's 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 a good one. It's a good one. It's a feel-good moment seeing Crusher Stampede uh, doing okay because it is one of one of the quintessential ways that turn is played. Uh, some sometimes they love balanced forces, and sometimes they love. Uh, swarms. Sadly, they can't do that anymore. Sometimes they love Nidzilla. Reporting it's just like duty, running a tech sir. company for God. And so, seeing Scorch Stampede not be shit is going to bring, you know, a few more people back into the faction. And um, it's probably a good example of of uh, big bugs in general. In other detachments as well, big bugs in general seeing a bit of a, a comeback story. Good. So, long story short, the Tyranid meta seems to be healing a bit. We're seeing a nice stabilized win rate. We're seeing healthy player numbers. We're seeing the ability to win local tournaments. Uh, and we're seeing a spreading out of the population of the faction over multiple different detachments. Uh, there's nothing really negative to say about Tyranids, um, apart from uh, GW, can you just unfuck an ending swarm, please? It wasn't overpowered. Like Green Tide, it was good, and then it would encounter something and just laminate itself against it. As someone that ran an ending swarm, it beat you once, and then it never beat you again. So just, just undo it, okay? Please. Please. Uh, Chaos Space Marines. Angry Spiky Boys. 48% win rate over 45% win rate is good. Six players out of 45 going four and one is good. One player out of that six, or one player out of that 45 winning a tournament. Good. Nothing wrong with any of that. Looking down at Renegade Raiders as the go-to competitive attachment. Half the players ran it, more than half. 46% win rate. Three out of the uh, you know, half of the uh, four and one people came here. Renegade Raiders looks great, fun and whimsical. Pat Bounzelots is a solid second uh, backup singer. It's a, you know solid bass player to the Chaos Band. You know it's uh, not not got as many not got as many players, but it's you know pulling in some consistently solid results. Um, there's a few areas that need fixing. For sure, we need a, we need. Um, Veterans of the Long War being sorted out, Dread Talons being sorted out, Soul Forge Warp Pack, uh, Warp Pack being sorted out, Deceptors realistically being sorted out, Dread Talons being sorted out. There's, there's, you know, there's like two good detachments, two okay, you know, two solid attachments, uh, four kind of flavorful but somewhat shitty ones, and then there is Chaos Cult. It's frankly out of control at this point. It's, it's frankly out of control. Now. There's only so long where there's only so long that we can kind of giggle at Chaos Cult and be like, oh, look at Chaos Cult, it's great. Look at Chaos Cult, you go guys, you go. There's only so long we can do that before we have to acknowledge that Chaos Cult is fucking broken. Because this week it had a 93% win rate. Now there was only it was only a small sample size. There were only two guys that ran it, but they won 13 out of 14 games. And in fact, Chaos Cult, it hasn't had, it never has more than two or three people playing. But every single time someone uses Chaos Cult, they get like 70 plus percent win rate. So normally, if it's like one week where this attachment has got like two players, normally if it's like one week where a, a detachment has only got like two players, a 90 percent win rate, We'd say that's an anomaly. Over the last, and let's just confirm this, 10 weeks. Over the last 10 weeks, Chaos Cult has managed to achieve 
a 74% win rate. That is higher than Eldar were at their peak. That is the highest consistently performing win rate of any faction and any detachment that I can personally remember ever since this data came out. Okay, that's a slight exaggeration, but it's definitely the highest win rate that I've seen in 10th edition consistently. I mean, that's higher than, that is higher than Harlequins were in 9th edition. Anyone that played Harlequins in 9th edition, that puts things into perspective. It is the humble opinion, this poor bloody guardsman, that Chaos Cult is one of the strongest detachments in the game right now and the reason why it has got away with it is because there has only been two people do running it a week not the same two people just two people running it a week and as a result week in week out people have just been like yeah it's a normal result yeah, it's a normal result yeah it's one multiple super majors not like one super major it's one multiple super majors okay like i'm trying to figure something out here let me look at some players here i can't see the players each week but considering that Considering how, okay, considering how ridiculously popular Renegade Raiders has been for Chaos Space Marines. Since the Balance Data Slate came out, Renegade Raiders has won four tournaments. Since Chaos Cult, uh, since the Balance Data Slate, Chaos Cult, despite having, I would say, like 5% napkin math off my head 5% of the player numbers has won three tournaments 5% of the player numbers comparable number of tournament wins multiple times it's had an 80% plus win rate it's not the same two dudes running it each time I'm sorry, Ayuchi, but I think, I think it's time for you to leave. <laughs> oh. Why are so, so Thorlek, why are so few people playing it? It's a great question, and I don't know the answer. Um, I can only suspect that so few people are playing it is because of the, uh, the model count. Um, so before Unending Swarm got completely nuked, uh, there was, it was in a similar place where like two or three people would, would be, two or three people running it, not necessarily every week, but two or three, like every, every month it won a tournament because there were two or three people that had honed it uh, very well um, and had all, and had like the hundred gargoyles that you needed for it to work. Um, and so, you know, it was, it was in a similar place where I had one build that was hugely competitive, you know, winning big events. Um, but it had very few player numbers because of purely the number of guards that had to run it. Um, and I think Chaos Court's in the same place where basically there is clearly an extremely potent viable build. We're seeing it win tournaments all over the world um, or do well all over the world, just little bits and bobs here and there and um and it's just not no one can be no one could be fucked building and painting 120 plus models for a niche build that as we've seen in the past is gonna get nuked into the ground so people will invest in renegade raiders because Renegade Raiders, you're not investing in Renegade Raiders, you're investing in a very nice, normal 
Space Marine, Chaos Space Marine has got some Legion Airs in it, Briner's in it, it's got some Presidents, it's got some Vindicators in it. Fuck it, there might even be a Land Raider in there. Okay, like, you can invest in Renegade Raiders to Chaos Space Marine player because you know that even when the balance data state comes and goes, you're going to be left over with an army that will still be relevant and will naturally come back round again. If you go into Chaos Cult and you buy 48 Accursed Cultists, not only is there a chance that GW just nerfs it back to the Stone Age with the next balanced data slate, because you've only had three months to build and paint it all, there's also a chance with niche models like that, GW just discontinues them. GW's never going to discontinue the Predator, GW's never going to discontinue uh, the Legionnaires, but GW absolutely could discontinue a random variety of cultists. But what he's seen them discontinue random varieties of cultists. You can't get the old cultists anymore. They're not even accommodated weapon-wise. You have to get the new ones. So no one's going to invest in a niche army like this. The people that will run an army like this are ones that either always wanted to run an army like this or ones that already had the models. So I happily ran Unending Swarm because I own 360 Tyranid small bugs, okay? I will happily run 200 plus pure infantry guard armies because I've spent 20 years building and painting that many guardsmen just bit by bit, okay? But if you're a Chaos Space Marine player, you're not going to go out there and buy yourself 100 plus fucking cultists if you've only got like 20 in your army. Build and paint them all. Take, you know, take them to one tournament and then them to be nerfed. So that's... That's why I think that when you have these incredibly potent niche builds, um, you only see a few people running them. Because it's, with the way 40k is these days, no one wants to invest in a niche build like that and just waste them the time and money. That's my theory. Such as it, as it is. It's why with Admech, even though... Ad, it, so before Admech had their big change, there was a viable build that ran like... 18 or 36 of the of the chicken walker things it was a lot of chicken walkers no one no one went only two or three people ended up actually committing to it because it was like two thousand pounds or two thousand dollars to get that army and people were like no it's fine like i'm never going to lose to it because i'm never going to account to it because the only person who was running it was a random dude in like finland or sweden scandinavia one of those you know, where the Vikings are from. Only like one, you know, those, that, I'm never going to encounter it. So I don't need to factor it into my equations. Um, and, you know, they can just like tear it up over there for a bit and then I'd never get fixed and then I won't have to worry about it anymore. Same thing with Chaos Call. Okay, uh, so long story short, Chaos is doing fine. We've got a couple of good attachments. They could do with some of the shitty attachments, you know, th they've been flavorful for a while now. Can we make them also, uh, you know, good now? Um, I'd like to see I'd like to see Iron Warriors fucking people up. Thank you. Uh, and then we've got um, Chaos Court, which definitely needs fixing. I've been I, I I personally have been giving Chaos Cult a lot of rope, but there's only so far we can let a detachment go. Um, Eldari, the pointy eared elves. Honestly, not much, no, nothing new. They're on a forty nine percent win rate, over forty eight percent win rate. They have got good player numbers, 32 player numbers, uh, five people going 4-1, and one. one person winning an event. What did they win? Was it big or small? It was it was smallish. 25 player, five round local uh, DT. That's exactly where Elder are right now. They're not the boogeyman that they once were, and they have some very clear weaknesses. The biggest problem with Elder right now is they just run out of stuff. They run out of stuff. So the moment they run into a Horde army, they basically just laminate themselves because the Horde army pushes forward like everything. The whether it's Horde of tanks or Horde of um, a Horde of infantry, the Horde army push forward everything. The Eldar come out and kill 40% of the enemy army in one go, and then the enemy army goes, "Well, I still got 60% of my army left," and then just wipe out the Eldar. Over played Eldar a lot in 10th edition. The number one way that you beat them is you just take their punch. If you can take their punch. Guard, guard a fucking Kryptonite to Eldar right now. Genuinely. Like, every single game I played against Eldar, the Eldar player, one turn or another, goes for a, has a go turn. 
and I'm like, shit, man, I just lost like four or five units. And I look down at my 13, 14 vehicle list and realize I still got eight vehicles left over. I still got 40, 50 infantry left over. I look at the elder army, which has only started with two or three fucking tanks, a few infantry, and I'm like, oh, what happens if I shoot back? Oh, I killed like four of your, I lost four units, and you lost four units, but you don't have, you, now, you, now you're spent. Elder are Elder are a very strong faction, but right. But if you can take the hit from them, um, they tend to just uh, uh, wither and die. Which is how they should be. Elder should be very fast and very punchy, but can't fight wars of attrition. And considering there are a few horde armies out there doing okay at the moment, uh, Elder are just sort of doing fine as well. They'll go four and one, but at some point on the journey, they're gonna hit guard, they're gonna hit a horde army, and then the Elder are gonna get very sad. Oh, dearie, dearie, dearie me. Okay, normally I get sick and tired of a faction which has been too powerful for too long. I'm sick and tired of Admech being shit. I've had enough of it. GW has tried everything to fix these guys. They have tried uh, making them really cheap in points. And it's not done anything. They've tried making them like a pseudo swarmy guard army. They've tried making them better. They've tried giving them they've tried quantity and they've tried quality. Not done anything. At the end of the day, there's only one thing they can do, I think. There's only one thing they can do. Make Admet work. Because, and we'll, we'll circle back to it in a moment. Because they've tried everything and the Admet win rate is fine. 49% win rate is fine. 48% win rate is fine. 48 win rate is fine. Okay, winning a tour, you know, going four and one with the player numbers, which we'll come back to in a moment, is fine. They've got a detachment. This is more than Gizilla Court have got. They've got one detachment, which is showing some promise. Scutari under cohort has been fine since the codex dropped. And here's the crazy thing: unlike so many armies, like Custodes, like Orcs, who have had their codex drop and then gone <laughs> going back to the index detachment, Scutari under cohort wasn't the wasn't the original detachment of the of the Admech. The original detachment was like the Rad Zone core with the fucking radiation going everywhere. So it's not like they've had to revert back to basics, revert back to the early days to get themselves to work. No, they've, they've, they've got new stuff and the new stuff is working. The problem is the player numbers. The player numbers are not shifting. Okay, so we we need to have a hard conversation here. And it's a hard conversation. I, I see there's two things left that, ad, that GW can do for Admech. Okay? One of these solutions is going to be very, very unpopular. But if Death Watch, a fucking Marine chapter, gets soft squatted, we don't see fucking more player numbers for Admech. Don't be surprised where this goes. Okay? So how do we avoid that? Because that's what that's option number one. Option number one is we 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 have the soft they get they get folded into Imperial agents. Option number one the other the other, the other option is that GW takes Imperial knights, and Admech, merges them. That's not that's so we say there's three options. Three options, okay. They take Imperial knights and Admech to bring them together. That might do something. Who knows? I, I've been saying that knights for a long time need access to infantry. Maybe that's one way GW can do it. Like. The night houses are now part of the Admech. That's a good solution. There is, however, a, and that might solve option number three. Because option number three is something we talk about every week. And it, it it's something that I think just needs to be sorted out. Every single week when we talk about Admech numbers, this is what I'm fucking sick of talking about, okay? Every single week we talk about Admech numbers, we say they're too expensive. I think that's like, I am about, I will, I agree with that 75%. Okay, but bear in mind, we've seen Admech be very, very popular and be relatively the same price, you know, take into account inflation, relatively the same price. Think of back to early 9th edition. Admech were broken OP as shit. You saw them at every fucking tournament. Is it a power thing or is it a price thing? Prices have gone up four times since then, at least. Maybe even six times, because GW does uh, buy annual price increases these days. Um, so they've gone up, maybe it's the fact that prices have gone up four to six times since last Admet, where well, that's good to the point where it doesn't make, it doesn't matter how good you make them. 
No one's gonna fucking buy them. So Chaos Demons, 51% win rate in line with a 50% win rate. Um, and five uh, people going four and one, but no one winning any tournaments with them. The, a tale as old as 10th edition. I could be saying exactly the same shit from the first month of 10th edition to what we are now, like the 15th month of 10th edition. Demons been doing demon things. It don't quite have what it takes to, to win tournaments consistently. Um, 34 players is pretty healthy numbers. That's as many as guard players. And um, yeah, they're fine. Whilst the Chaos Demon win rate hasn't changed much, <coughs> they have remained a popular faction. They have remained a faction that can go form on fairly regularly. What has consistently changed for demons is what they are bringing to remain relevant. It starts out as Total Monster Mash. Uh, Bella, it started out as Index Bellacore. We then moved to um, Index Bellacore, but with VD, when a couple of uh, Great and Clean ones turned up. Then we moved to um, Bellacore's uh, Angry Teenage Phase, when actually Bellacore left and uh, the Bloodthirsters came in. And now we are seeing the evolution of the Angry Demon Teenage Phase because uh, not only are Corn Demons now clearly very good, but uh, specifically Blood Crushers are... Uh, Blood Crushers are possibly the best Chaos Demon unit right now. And I was put onto this two or three months ago. When I played Isaac with his Corn Demons, when I went uh, undefeated at that tour team tournament with the with the Mechy Vank, uh, and Isaac said to me, "Blood Crushers, that's what you want to watch." Uh, and slowly but surely, the Blood Crushers have emerged. If you go, so the the new the new thing with Chaos Demons is the win rate's not shifted or anything like that. Fuck that. The new internal meta of Chaos Demons, the new thing you need to adapt to with these bastards is the Blood Crushers. If you're not ready for Blood Crushers, you are going to have a bad time. Nothing real new to talk about with Grey Knights. 52% win rate is going in the right direction against the average of 49%. Four people have gone uh, four more with them, but no one won any tournaments. And in fact, Grey Knights have won four tournaments over the last six weekends. Um, nearly all of them small local affairs. The reason why I have that reaction to Grey Knights is because um, I'm kind of bored of them. A bit like Admech. They just they haven't changed. At least Chaos Demons have had the goddamn common courtesy to basically completely reinvent themselves every three months since the beginning of 10th edition. Like, I... Chaos Demons and Grey Knights are like two perfectly opposite factions. Because Chaos Demons and Grey Knights both have indexes. Chaos Demons and Grey Knights have both got the same attachment rules since the beginning of the edition. Maybe some minor changes, I can't remember. But uh but Chaos Demons have had three or four wildly, or at least significantly different ways of playing and have remained fresh and interesting to this point where I look forward to playing Chaos Demons even when they absolutely run me over because I learn something about them. I look forward. I look forward to the day when I get the opportunity to get absolutely fisted by Blood Crushers. I look forward to this, okay? Because the last time I played against Chaos Demons, they didn't have any Blood Crushers. They had lots of Blood Lairs and Blood Thirsters. And the time before that, they had Great and Clean ones. The time before that, there was like Shalaxi and Bellacor rocking all over the place. Like, Chaos Demons are interesting. Grey Knights went from teleporting around and scoring, scoring points to, oh, maybe we'll use a lot of Dread Knights to... No, we're going to go back to teleporting around and scoring points. But this time we've got Dread Knights that also teleport around and score points. Oh, I'm going I'm to shoot you. Oh, I'm going to teleport away. Oh, okay. I'm going to shoot his other unit. Oh, that's going to teleport away well, his way because it's got a stra it's got a stratagem. Oh, okay. I'm going to shoot this unit. Ah, oh, you can't. Why? Wow, you're over 18 inches away. 
I played a strategy when I dropped down. Oh, so one army, you've got three ways not being able to interact with you. That's good. Oh, what about that one unit I can shoot? Oh, yeah, you can shoot that one. Arm of Contempt. Oh. Oh, okay. It's good. It's like... Grey Knights... Just a bit shit and uninteractive. And it's a shame, because I actually think Grey Knights are kind of cool. I've, I've never really understood the hate around the, the Dread Knight. I think it's a relatively cool model. It's big fucking exosuit armor. Reminds me of the Walker things from uh, Matrix 3. It, I'm not saying Matrix 3 was a great movie. I'm saying the fucking Captain Mifuni going around blasting people was pretty fucking cool. So, you know, I don't, you know, Grey Knights, fine. Models are awesome. Dread Knights, fine. Models are awesome. The lore behind Grey Knights, it's grim dark as fuck. They mind white people even though they don't need to. Why not? Who's going to tell them no? Not the people that just mind wipe. They can't remember them. Like, I'm totally okay with a lot of stuff with Grey Knights. They're a venerable faction that's been around for ages. Okay? Like, they've got history. They've got pedigree. They've got everything, man. Like, they're cool as fuck. They just, in 10th edition, are supremely boring and unfun and uninteractive. That's why I don't like Grey Knights. And they've been doing it for 15 months now. I'd quite like for them to change the record. I have no issue with Grey Knights. If Grey Knights were more powerful and started running into me and beating my face off, um, I would welcome it for a good, like, six months. But right now, when the last three games I've played against Grey Knights... They've either drawn or won, or I've only, or I've only, uh, one win, one draw, one loss against Grey Knights in the last three games I've played. The game that they they won, I didn't kill a single model. They didn't let me. Very good play for my opponent. Very poor play for me. I'm not denying that. I'm accepting my mistakes and I'm one, I'm learning from them. But at the same time don't really think you should be able to win a game of 4k without killing a single one of my models. That doesn't feel great. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's like, oh, I've drawn a card. That means I have to kill you. I'm going to new orders that one. Fucking time. Yeah. It's a sad state of affairs when I hold more hatred towards Grey Knights. And I do towards Custodes, Eldar, and Tau combined. But uh, personal feelings aside, Grey Knights are totally in a totally competitive and totally fine place right now. Uh, so, yeah, they're actually great. I just don't like playing against them. Ashton Militarum! Nah, don't you talk about these guys. I'm only kidding. To the moon, baby. 52%. Suck my dick. Woo! Here we go, boys. Here we go. The line only goes up. It only goes up 52%. Now, last week it was 51%. Now it's 52%. It might be a slow grinding advance, but that's two weeks in a row when we've been above our average. That's two weeks in a row when we've been above 50%. So all the two weeks in a row when technically we're still in the gold lock zone. So GW, don't change anything. Also, seriously, don't change anything. Guard are just in a nice spot right now. Uh, now, we didn't win a tournament today or this weekend, uh, but we did keep having that steady rate of four and one wins in, which is good. We did see a slight dip in our playing numbers, which is unusual. I think it was a slightly busier week, but it's important to remember that last week, we had a big spike. Last week, we were up to um, 50. So we just had a bit of a glut. And then people were taking a week or two off. And then I expected the next week or the week after for us to probably have a bit of a bit of a spike again. Um, play, but look, saying, oh, we only had 34 players. It's quite it's quite nice as 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 guard to be able to like oh on on one of our quiet weeks we only had like fucking three times the number of admech players 
We only had like the same number of players. Fucking El, we had more players than Eldar, who were like who started out as the fucking boogeyman of the edition. You know, like yeah, we are seeing a few factions overtake us. Like uh, you know, there being more Tau players than us, that feels a little uncomfortable. Uh, more turn players, that yeah, probably feels about right. Turn are pretty popular, but um, but guard, but guard, thirty-four players, I'm pretty okay with it. Like, like I said, I think we'll see a spike. The numbers back up again. Um, guard have been on a really like. If we just look at the whole stat line here, fifty-two percent over forty-nine. Like I said, four people going for one, but no one winning any tournaments. All this, although we do know that our very own World War One Verdun did win. Um, the narrative event at Nova, so that's important to note. Uh, but the thing here is, like, we've won six tournaments over the last ten weeks. So pretty much every other weekend, Guard wins a tournament. That's not bad. And when we actually compare this to some of the other factions out there, like, there are some ridiculous ones, like Sisters and Drukari. And Thousand Suns and Necrons, but then after that, out of 26 factions, out of 26 factions, I think Guard might have won maybe the 10th most tournaments. Just, I've just eyeballed it. Not a bad place to be in. Could be, be a lot worse. Be a lot worse. So yeah, Guard are in a, in a in a pretty strong position right now, um, and I have to say, it does not seem to be a coincidence to me that Guard has started doing well when uh, our tanks got a boost. Uh, there's there's a couple of things that could be drawn out from that. Firstly, tenth edition is the addition of tanks and vehicles. Like tanks and vehicles, gem and mech up. Hashtag mech up. Are you a struggling faction? Mechanize up. Genius to cool players. Just buy six trucks. Just get out there. Um, mech up. Now I think that uh, with guard being uh, getting a boost to our vehicles, more players were naturally encouraged to try out more vehicles, and as a result, um, they started finding that nth really help you. Know, really, really leans into vehicles and monsters. The other thing is though. Like guard players like vehicles so a lot you we're seeing a slight you know sort of every so often seeing sort of a big spike in guard players but generally speaking the population numbers are going in the right direction but not so i, I think we're seeing but it's not just more people getting into faction more people will I, I tend to find that guard players have a great reserve of armor they may begrudgingly begrudgingly build them over many years build the way up to like a hundred infantry grudgingly but a guard player will happily in six months buy that tank company or two easily so when you make guard so because of this when you make guard tanks better suddenly for a lot of guard players not only do they become more enthusiastic about their faction and start enjoying their faction more but also they're like oh Lima's vanquishers are good. I happen to have three of those. There we go. Oh, Chimera's happen to be good now. I happen to have five of those. Put them on the fucking table. But if you do the same thing with infantry, it's like, so, um, 120 infantry is good. Most guard players will go, nah, I don't like running really an infantry. I'll, uh, I'll just stick to one of my tanks. But tanks aren't as good. Yeah, I'll just stick to one of my tanks. So, mate, so that's why I think we're starting to see Guard do well. It's not just that we've had a few buffs here and there. I think that those buffs are easily accessible to us as a community as a whole. That's something a bit different, see? Not the same shit day in, day out for Guard. Different shit for us. And for some other factions. Just, just not Grey Knights. Just not Grey Knights. Nothing different for them. Um, okay, N speaking of factions where nothing fucking changes... Uh, Necrons! It's Hypercrypt. It's still Hypercrypt. My god. I, I will suck off every person in the GW balance team if they can just make Hypercrypt 
not so oppressively common. Please. Okay. Like, I don't like it when Grey Knights teleport all over the place. You can imagine how unenthusiastic I am about Necrons teleporting all over the place. Necrons should be like a silver tide. Not teleporty, bloody, I want to be Grey Knights, but with actually good vehicles. Now, joking aside, what, what makes Hive Equip so powerful? It, it's the vehicles. So they do what Grey Knights do. Grey Knights drop down, do fuck all damage, and then die. So what Grey Knights do is, instead, they drop down... Uh, so what uh, so drop down in hidden places score points or and all that kind of stuff necrons drop down blast your ass with their uh, quite powerful vehicles there's nothing left to shoot back at them so then they teleport up at the end of your turn and then next one they teleport down a new area and blast your ass with the vehicles again i heard a very very good solution to hypercrypt the other day someone said don't do anything just make it so you can't pick up the vehicles or you can't pick up all the vehicles maybe it's like three non-vehicle and monster units and one vehicle or monster unit um, or I thought that was quite a good solution because it means Hypercrypt retains the flavor of being jumpy uppy downy uh, men but uh, it stops them it stops it from being quite so obviously the best way to do it and but um, but Necrons are Necrons have really shown an ability to weather the storm after quite a few rounds of nerfs and tweaks and changes, uh, they're still on a 54% win rate. They're still bringing home regular 4-1 um, uh, from uh, from their from their detachments, although it's pretty much all hyper equipped. Uh, they uh, have kept very very strong player numbers, and uh, their average win rate is 50%. If, if, if Necrons are, are Necrons are the scourge of the mid tables, they don't often make it to the top tables, although they are obviously can win tournaments but uh necrons are one of those factions which you're gonna encounter every event and you you're gonna encounter them in the bottom tables and you're going to encounter them in the middle tables and you're going to encounter them on the uh on the uh, on the upper tables they're just very popular very powerful very common and it's always fucking hypercrypt this is the one that i want to see do well I really, really want to see a return to Silver Tide. If you had to ask me what I preferred, Silver Tide or Hyper Crypt, I would say I preferred fighting Silver Tide because um, Silver Tide, whilst very, very durable, felt very, very Necron. Oh, you knocked down half my blob, it gets back up again because of my Necron. I got that, I've seen that in Dawn of War. But Hyper Crypt, maybe it wouldn't be so bad if Overwatch was uh like more prevalent or something but then that's going to unlock a whole load of other problems which i know a lot of people are like no more here don't say that no free overwatch rebel anymore it's not 8th edition yeah I, I get it i get it yeah like i said i, I I'm, I'm genuinely not against necrons and realistically i'm not actually against hypercrypt uh i just would like a little bit of variety a little bit of variety uh space wolves how oh, interesting i don't mean to alarm you Space Wolves have changed. For the first time that I can remember, Stormlands is not a popular attachment. So for the beginning, so Space Wolves are a faction that, like you've heard me talk a lot of shit about Necrons tonight and Grey Knights and stuff, Space Wolves are one of those factions which um, I used to give a lot of uh, a lot of shit to because it was it got to the point where I was like, Space Wolves, Stormlands, Wolf Jail, blah. And, and that's all I could say about them because there was nothing that was changing about them. Space Wolves are a fact, an example of how Games Workshop can absolutely uh, get things right. So they have a 58% win rate, which is probably a little strong, against an average of 54% win rate, which is probably indicates that they're a little strong. Um, and, but then weirdly, like they've, they've only got like four people going four and one uh, out of 21 people. Weirdly, they don't have a huge amount of players, although we have that player number has increased uh, more recently. So that, that, that they've got good win rates and everything. But what's most exciting to me is, is that Stormlands, even though it's still obviously very, very powerful with a 61% win rate against an average 56% win rate and has four tournament wins over the last uh, 10 weeks, Champions of Russ now more popular. And that might be a one-off week. It is only by one. It's a pretty small margin. But it has been getting, slowly but steadily, more and more popular 
to the point where it rivals Stormlands, and now it's starting to exceed it. Now, I am convinced a significant part of this is going to be because Champions of Rust received an update in the last Banner Status League that made it actually good. I also think that a significant part of this is going to be Space Wolf players thanking James Workshop for just another way to run their army. Because I, I know at my local club at Just Play, a chap that called Alex, I want to do a battle with him, he fucking loves the Space Wolves. But every goddamn Space Wolf unit under the sun, um, beautifully painted, you will have seen him in the After Action reports. Kid obviously fucking loves the Space Wolves, all right? He got so sick of running Wolf Jail himself that he built an Ultramarines army. Just went, I like Marines. Marines are my jam. I'm sick of Wolf Jail, so I'm just going to build an Ultramarines army. I've got, I think he had a whole bunch of like leftover Marine models that he was never going to use for Space Wolves. So he was like, fuck it. I'll just paint them up blue. I can always repaint them space walls if I need to. You know, doesn't really matter. So, uh, and he's been running. He just did that because he just got sick of running Wolf Jail. And then they revamped Champions of Rust. And guess what? He's absolutely back in the, the saddle. He's back on a space wolves. And the last time I saw him run a space wolf army, he only had like one or two units of Thunderwolf Cavalry. The rest of it was all sorts of other different units. He had some jump back into this. It's all very fast moving, hard hitting. Space Wolf kind of stuff. Beyond was in there, all that kind of stuff. But his army had changed significantly. And uh, I think Space Wolves are a good example, an example that GW needs to follow, where you can add variety back into an army and make it powerful and make it interesting. It's, it doesn't need to be done sweeping, but if any army right now has only got one good detachment, GW needs to go through and start making them have a second good detachment. And that just sort of solves all the animosity towards a faction which is just running the same shit every time and it makes those players feel happy about the faction they're running because they're not getting shit and also they're able to experiment because at the end of the day we're all very creative people in warhammer why we build and make our own fucking models a lot of okay so we are getting into we're getting close to top three now uh but before we get to the podium we do have thousand suns ah ah fucking ah thousands are real strong right now Fucking hell, boys. Look at this. 54%, 58%, 50-fucking-9%, man. Jesus. That's a big number. Not the biggest. There's a couple other people that need need it as well, but 59%. Seven people went 4-1. and one. No tournament wins, though. Somewhat telling. And 35 players. Thousand Sons having 35 players, that's a big increase in their population. And a 59% win rate is significantly higher than a 54% win rate. May try and argue that um, Thousand Sons aren't overpowered. I would push back and say that on average, this is the first weekend in a while that when they haven't won a tournament. Nine tournaments. Out of, uh, over the course of 10 weekends. Thousands of thousands are overpowered. Uh, it's it's the same shit that's been overpowered for a, a while now. It's uh, being able to draw a line of sight from any Psyker. Uh, it's essentially having access to a bunch of free stratagems, um, which other people don't get because of Cabal points. That's, that's basically what Cabal points are. It, it, they're just stratagems that are just dressed up. Oh, I can do some free mortal wounds. That's most like, like a lot of stratagems. Oh, I can uh, get like a, a free sort of save or re-roll or blank or I can't remember what it is, but I got I can spend some points and get a and get a, a do-over on a save or a better save. Oh, okay. Combat, the reason why Thousand Suns are so powerful is everyone else is running around with like one or two CP a turn. They are running around with four or five times that with the amount of shit they can slap down in a battle round. That's why thousands are about. Uh, how do you fix thousand suns? Uh, just a lot less cabal points. They shouldn't be able to get everything they want off. You should be able to, with thousand suns, probably unleash two or three cabal related things maximum. 
battle round, even if you're really going for the battle points. That's how it should be. The other way that you could you could balance it, if that seems a little harsh, is make uh, fuck off the cabal points entirely, give them access to all of the uh, all of the things, uh, but make them one use only each. Maybe one gets an extra one. They're like nine miles to do one twice. That would be cool. But one way or another, cabal points are probably the prob are almost certainly the problem. Um, and cabal points are where things are going to need to be fixed. I don't mean to throw shade at Art of War again, but fellas, are we still sure Drakari are a bottom eight faction? Because I'm looking at a 62% win rate. I'm looking at 23 players. Five, four of which went four and one, and someone won a tournament with them. Now, the tournament might not be very big. It literally was the smallest event of the of the weekend. 23 player, five rounds. But really feel like maybe I really get the strong impression that Drukari aren't a bottom eight faction. They might be a bottom eight faction if you only look through the lens of can it win a super major but that is looking at this through the lens of the minority not the majority the majority of dark elder players and the majority of players that play against dark elder it does seem that they are a wee bit over over tuned it seems strong it seems like even though there's not a huge amount of people going four and one or um, or winning tournaments with them, although they have on average won a tournament every single weekend for the last ten weekends, uh, it seems like every dark elder player is sort of just casually strolling into three and two. If you decide to give a shit that day, you'll go four and one, and if you play at your local tournament, you'll probably win it. Most people. They're going to have a problem with that. Not a problem as in like they hate it. It's like fuck Dark Elder. No, no, no. What I mean is it's going to cause them problems because they're not playing in a Super Major. Playing in their local tournament. So my assessment of Dark Elder right now is they are the scourge of the local meta. Not quite able to fly with the big boys in the Super Major meta, which is why you do sometimes see very, let's be clear here, very knowledgeable, very good players. Uh, they aren't actually as good as they look. Fair assessment, depending on you know, where you're peering into the into the meta. Uh, but um, I think it is important to note that uh, for the every man on the street, for the uh, for the PDF trooper guarding his, uh, his local agri world, the Drakari um, are definitely a faction that are going to give you a run for your money. As someone who has played them twice recently, tell you uh, that it was two. Uh, one game was was fairly fairly one sided. Smash that. One game was a very close run thing. Uh, one lucky explosion from me, and one failed charge from my opponent uh, swung the game. Big time. So uh, yes, in summary. Fear the dark. Because the dark is going to come and diddle you. Coming in second, we have Sisters of Battle. Now, I'm just going to wait a moment. Godlike Poet, would you like to attempt to convince me uh, for another week in a row that Sisters are totally fine? Or can we perhaps admit that sisters are fucking broken. <laughs> 63 percent win rate. Bear in mind this was with some of the harshest preemptive nerfs we have ever seen. And they are still 
at a 63% win rate. And I don't mean to upset you further, dearest faceless viewer, but when you take, as, as the tile's on, I just said, when you take out the mirror matches, with them having 47 players, with them having over 5% of the player base, uh, there's a chance that that win rate is more like 65, 68% win rate. Uh, mirror matches can increase the win rate by much as 5%. Um, so Sisters won, uh, Sisters has a 63% win rate against an average of 54%. So just a casual 11% jump on a busy weekend featuring Super Majors. A casual 11%. They had... 14 players, so that is um, basically 33% of their players go 4-1 uh, and one or better because they did win four tournaments. <sighs> four tournaments, which they, they have added to their rather eye-watering number of 17 tournament wins. Now, this is not 17 tournament wins since the beginning of 10th edition. This is 17 tournament wins in the last 10 weeks. That's quite a lot. And um, of those 17 wins, 15 of them have been achieved with Bringers of the Flame. Which, there may be a few minor indicators that this detachment was a bad idea. Because not only does it have a 63% win rate, which is just a casual 8% increase over its average 55%. It's also responsible for 13 out of 14 of the people that went 4-1 or, or better this week. And it's also responsible for 100% of the tournament wins this week. And it's responsible for 15 out of 17 tournament wins over the last 10 weeks. And it also had 41 out of 47 players. I mean, like... That's even more than the Dark Angels. That was quite a lot. Yeah, I know we're being a little bit silly and a little bit facetious and we've definitely uh, ruined the joke by overcommitting to it. But, uh, I, Sisters, plainly broken. Um, giving an army, like army-wide, like assault and X strength. It's a one or the other dealio. The way you fix that, Give Army Wide Assault to like one of the other detachments. Keep this one with the uh, the extra strength. One or the other, man. Make people pick between speed and power. Don't give the one attachment all the speed and all the power. It's uh, results in this. That's how I'd fix sisters <clears throat> as a starter. Split it out. Give them an extra. Give them an extra attachment. Fuck it. New detachment brings the flame. Uh, that get that they're bringing the flame. Okay, they get the action movement. Um, then you can have purging purges of the damned. Give them the extra strength. Boom. <laughs> Game Guru Mordian, please. I still get my built. Give me another few weeks. Sorry, can't do that, Dave. <laughs> uh, yeah, but sisters are. Um, you know, what you, you may have, you, some of you may have noticed that um, that my, you know, my my vitriol towards this the battle is somewhat lessened than my vitriol uh, versus things like uh, Necrons and uh, Grey Knights. Uh, the big reason for that is um, even though sisters are, you know, the player numbers are exploding. And uh, we're seeing them definitely become the inheritors of the meta. And they're even starting to try and fuck up the uh, Thousand Suns fairly regularly. Um, I, there's still a fact. There's still not a faction which has completely infested 
uh, my local uh, scene. And so uh, I don't I don't play them as much. So not playing them as much basically uh, means that I'm not as bored of them. Like, you know, joking aside, you know, Game Guru's like, please give me a chance it was his built. I, I don't really have much of a problem. Um, you know, sisters, sisters should be dealt with over a period of time, <clears throat> over a longer period of time. They shouldn't be given the orc treatment where they basically come in and just fucking chop the legs off and blast the head off. Um, no, they, sisters should be have the Eldar treatment where they get slowly toned down because there's clearly there's some power there, but like, there's a lot of power there. Uh, but there are a lot of people that are only just sort of getting into it. So I don't, I've no, I've no, I don't have the faction fatigue against sisters. And so whilst I absolutely acknowledge that they definitely need toning down, uh, I'm not bored of playing them. And that's important because also not only am I not bored of playing them, because I've only played them maybe like half a dozen times in 10th edition so far, but also every time I play sisters, they've been a bit different. They've, had a slight, they've been a bit different each time. Sometimes they've been Brings of the Flame. Sometimes they've been... I think I even played like Hallowed Martyrs one time. Something crazy. Um, yeah, they've always been a little bit different. So my, my my number one thing that I would like to see with the Sisters Battle Change is kind of like with Necrons. <clears throat> I just want them to not have Brings of the Flame as being so obviously a better choice. Not so bothered about the power. It's the... Uh, I'd like to, before I get bored of playing against Brings of the Flame, I'd like to preemptively, if you're going to preemptively Nerf Sisters, I'd like to preemptive the um, detachment variety. And honestly, before we get to Death Watch, honestly, I think that's the biggest problem with a lot of facts in 10th edition. Um, just like, so, so samesy every single time. Um, Maybe I'm being a little bit greedy because I do remember a time of before 10th edition when uh, you got your codex, it didn't have any detachment stuff, it was just the army rules, and uh, if, you know, there, if there was one viable build for army, then that was it and it never changed. So I maybe I'm being a little bit greedy and it is important to remember where we've come from as a competitive community, um, but you know, in the interest of giving, you know, toning down the uh, rhetoric for a moment, giving some honest feedback and in the very, 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 very unlikely chance that any of this feedback in any way, shape or form gets back to Games Workshop and the balance team. Number one issue that is facing 40k right now, the one issue that is causing things to be a little stale and quickly becoming stale, like it's only 10 weeks or 10, 11 weeks since the last balance data slate. And yet we're already talking about the meta being solved and the game being, uh, you know, all we talk about factions being fucking boring is uh, even some that have had updates since the Bath Day of Slate is um, because there only ever seems to be a sort of one way to play a lot of armies. Um, and so what I think GW really needs to do is, yeah, they, they've definitely got a few factions which are causing some issues balance wise. Like, I think if you deal with these, I think you deal with these top these top three right here they're the ones that need toning down and you take these uh like things like gene silver court and space marines and other and admech and you make them more interesting uh but i think but you know or you boost them up a little bit but i think the number one thing that's currently uh the number one thing that is, is a threat to 40k as a game and a threat to 40k as a business product for games workshop is um variety there are some factions which i praise endlessly for getting more variety space wolves champions of russ great uh net cross a brief time it was great seeing canoptic court and hypercrypt sort of neck and neck now i'm lambasting them again because only hypercrypts uh, i shit on gray knights because they're boring they just do the same thing every game I shit on imperial knights because they're boring they're just a stat check army I shun Admech because they're expensive and they're boring. They only run Skatari Hunter Cohort. Um, I don't shit on Care Space Marines and every single week I wank Care Space Marines off until they're utterly fucking bone dry and their balls are shoveled up into raisins because they've got eight fucking detachments and even the shitty ones are interesting and fun to use. 
Likewise, with Tyranids, I wank Tyranids off and say they're interesting and fun because you've got multiple attachments and things, things like things like Crusher Stampede come back is awesome. And I wank Tau off in a world where I did an hour-long video on how much I fucking hate Tau. I have completely turned my opinion around on that because Tau now actually have three very playstyles. Yes, they are still somewhat of a variant on Apply Gun, but at least there's sort of different guns being applied in different fucking ways, and crew are at least there, and Vespid are at least there, and, and focusing on the auxiliaries is actually making them interesting. They're, they're a lot better than they used to be. Okay? A lot better than they used to be. And, like, you know, there's, there's a reason why I... I I am sad for Votan because they haven't got any new data sheets and they need them. There's a reason why I am sad for Custodes because their codex was so shit that they're just basically running their index again. Okay, and there's a reason why every week, despite the fact that I say uh, Gene Stiller Cult are in a terrible place, every single week I talk about them positively and fondly because at least they're fucking interesting. Games Workshop. Let me give you some feedback here. You have done amazing work with 10th edition. Some people are not going to believe me on this. Some people are going to shit on me for saying this. You have done amazing work on 10th edition. Your dedication and focus on balance has been on point. You've not always got it right, but more so than any other time in the last 20 years of me playing this game, have you actually tried to get balance right? And yeah, there's a few fucking outliers. But you tried. Now, <clears throat> keep up tweaking some of the top three and the bottom three. But really, that's where 50% of your effort maximum should go for a little bit. The other 50% of the effort needs to go into making factions have multiple playstyles and be interesting. Because some of them are some of them are dying. Factions are fucking dying because they are boring. And it's a fine line between being interesting and, oh God, we overcooked it and it's super, super powerful. But there are, you have examples to draw upon. You have Tau, you have Tyranids, and you have Care Space Marines of ways to do it right. That is my feedback current competitive state of 10th edition and the state of 10th edition in general now let's get to the uh the anomalous result death watch there goes my hero death watch they just won't fucking die death watch just won't fucking die i mean they're gonna die but Death Watchers won't fucking die. 75% win rate. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. It's one dude. Probably the last time we're going to see. Probably the last time we're going to see a de Death Watch getting there. If it's not this week, it'll be soon. Imperial agents are out now. And uh, people are, we've seen people run them previously. They're basically just waiting for a balance update to uh, let them hit the tables. But uh, to, to this crazy bastard that took his death watch six and eight. I salute you, man. One last final hurrah. And, uh... I do think this warrants a conversation in the 40k community. Some of you got to roll your eyes right now, but... In the old world, GW legends half the factions. Some of you don't know this. They call them legacy factions. 
very similar legends legacy and these were some factions which were as popular as skaven possibly the most popular faction outside of space marines games workshop has ever released you ask anyone at any any time i do a total war campaign people say play skaven Anytime people say, what new army should I say, what new army should I get from the channel for all the people say Skaven? Okay, Skaven is just really, really popular. So even factions like Skaven were made legacy, okay? Uh, but you also had like Dark Elves, Ogres, um, and Lizard Men. Oh, genuinely. Actually. Um, and so GW, because of many, many reasons, took half the factions and put them into legacy and said you cannot you put out a, put out a statement the warhammer community saying you cannot use these at tournaments you can don't think about bringing your demons to a tournament they didn't say our tournaments they said any tournament they, they went these are not for tournaments and there are a lot of reasons you can criticize the old world community. There are a lot of grognards in there. The community is basically a decade out of touch with uh, etiquette at tournament play. Um, it's, it's It can be a bit beardy. It's it's a 50-50 mix of people, of the best people getting into it right now um, and who are forcing the old grognards to modernize and, and revolutionize. Uh, but... You know, it, there's a few, you know, it's not a perfect game. It's not a perfect community. The one thing that that community has done better than anything else is say, fuck you, GW. All legacy factions are allowed at tournaments. We don't care if they're not supported. We don't even care if they're broken and overpowered. Vampire counts are a problem. That's okay. They still get to play. That's okay. And the response from this because the old world community hasn't meekly sat down and taken it and it's gone no we're no, no we still play these things and they're still tournament legal and they're okay the response from games workshop has been oh well the scope of the game has now grown and there's a general understanding even if it might take a few years general understanding that games workshop is now kind of looking at this whole legacy thing and thinking not all, but some of these guys might might make their way back into the main game, maybe in a future edition of the old world. And that's great. And GW has all but come out and said that's going to happen. There's been a lot of nudge, nudge, wink, wink, you know, okay, we've heard you were going in that direction. Um, And I can't help but think that we need a similar thing in 40k. Can't help but think we need to be like, okay, um... Fuck this Legends thing, man. Legends are loud. Maybe, you know, and you might say, but the points don't get updated and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, yeah, that's fine. Most Legends things are terrible. That's all right. And if there are, um, if there are some uh, units that need uh, tweaks and whatnot, um, I think the important thing to... Uh, to remember is that there it, 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 it's difficult it's very very difficult and it, it does take people of spectacular will and drive to make it happen but um proper proper community led shit can work good example of this is the old itc so everything that you see with GW doing like meta watch and seasons and changes and secondary missions and all that kind of stuff, all of it came from the ITC to the point where Games Work and, and Frontline Gaming, point where Games Workshop has like bought, it's, it's sort of got quietly announced that like Games Workshop and Frontline Gaming are basically like in bed with each other now, and um, or if not have been fully bought out or something. There's, there's something's been going. I'm, I'm probably butchering the, the details of it. The point is that GW basically bought like all the ITC shit and stuff like that, and um, because the ITC became, it was completely fan made. But ITC, who, who played Aethers back in the day? No one played the GW official fucking tournament shit. It didn't, it didn't exist. And if it did exist, it was shit. 
everyone played ITC. It was just better. And I think that we're probably... I think we're probably getting similar... Something, probably getting to the point where we might need something similar with 40k again. Because, um... Can't be squatting. You can't be fucking squatting Death Watch. Um, you can't be. You can't be. Cons you know, GW. You know, we, it's it, it's crazy, but we never used we never used to listen to Games Workshop, and now everyone listens to them. Maybe we need a little bit of a as a community, like no, no, Games Workshop. Um, we're the, we're gonna tell you how we want this to be now, and uh, we're gonna keep Death Watch as a separate faction. And we're going to let Ledgers in again. And these are the points cost that we've come up with. I don't know. It's kind of crazy. But um, a man can dream. A man can hope. The reality of the situation is, is that we're probably too used to sucking on the dick of uh, EW at the moment. Probably too used to sucking on the fetid nipple. And, uh, and, as, and, they, and maybe... Everything I've said, you know, can be, you know, we can take all of that, and uh, and we can throw it up against the fact that the game is generally more balanced. And have we had, have we had to make some sacrifices to balance the game? Maybe that's the other side of the coin. Very, very willing to uh, to see it from that perspective. But it's just sad seeing a faction like Death Watch go away, and it just feels that the whole thing could have been handled better. I guess really that's what it's about. Maybe all these grandiose and silly plans about belling against the man. Maybe, maybe they are silly. But uh, one thing I can say is it's sad to see Death Watch get shat on. Sad to see them go away. Um, and like I said, it just leaves a bad taste in my mouth. A few last, uh, we've been a, been a little bit all over the place. Been a little bit all over the place with that um, um, that uh, meta analysis. Tried to add some different things in there this week. All right, but thank you all for joining. Appreciate all of the support. I hope you enjoyed it, and of course, as always, see you guys next time. Would you like to know more? If so, then please consider becoming a channel member or patron. By supporting the channel, not only will you be doing your part, but you'll also be helping me create more content for your viewing pleasure and unlocking a whole host of perks. You get everything from a badge next to your name, custom emojis, but the big one is access to the Mordian Glory Discord server, an online community with almost two and a half thousand active members. It's always popping off in the MG Discord. We've got channels for army lists, hobbying, tactics, stories, and even a pretty spicy meme section as well. For all you greenhorns that wanted to see the Mordian glory hole, today is your lucky day. And joking aside, I do want to say a massive thank you to all of the current channel members and patrons. You guys are amazing. Truly the lifeblood of the channel. I could not do Mordian glory full time without the incredible and generous support of my members so thank you guys so much and last but certainly not least i want to say a personal thank you to all of my top tier patreons these are the war masters the people who have truly gone above and beyond the call of duty to a heartfelt thank you to alex dengal bon bon vert lord prior mark panconi rj scorpion swordfish trombone try again bragg John Stubbs, Nick Walsh, Diesel Fox, and August Barney. Seriously, guys, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Your support is incredible, and it makes a huge difference. Thank you so much. That's all for now. Hope you've all enjoyed today's video, and of course, as always, see you guys next time.